Hello, everyone. Danny Rains here again, and certainly glad to be here. It's uh, getting close to Christmas when we're recording this today, and so I'd like to wish everyone out there a Merry Christmas and a uh, Happy New Year and Happy Holidays. Gosh, uh, it seems like the whole year has gotten by so fast this year that, man, it's time to start another one, <laughs> and that's a good thing. But uh, I want to speak with you today about the book. Uh, it's finally published now, and I started getting a lot of emails and calls last week that folks had ordered the book, and and um, basically we're getting them in. So I want to take a few minutes today and kind of share with you how this thing came about because uh, it's really interesting. I mean. This was not my idea to write a book. I never thought I'd be a publisher. <laughs> but uh, on the request of many people that I, I usually have in my classes, in, as I instruct classes, they said, well, you need to write a book. Because I always illustrate the topic with a lot of, you know, situations that may have occurred to me in the past. So when, you, when we're going through it, it's just it's just amazing. My mind's whir whirling the whole time. And I'm thinking, like, well, when I tell you to ground or I tell you to cover up, I can tell you a time when I didn't or I didn't do it correctly or I know somebody that didn't do it correctly and something bad happened to them. And that's what this book is all about. It's about it's a series of short stories. And some of them are very humorous. <laughs> some of them I couldn't tell you the names because I didn't want to incriminate anybody. <laughs> And also, uh, it's just, it's a real story. It's short stories of things that happened to me as I came along. And I learned a lot from the folks that I was working with, but I also learned a lot from personal experiences of trying to do something different than what I was taught. And I think it's what happens today. It's a lot of time. I mean, there's this week, I understand we had two fatalities this past week. I was up in Pennsylvania doing some training up there for for a company up there and while i was there i found out uh someone got killed in i don't know was it iowa i think and then there was another lineman that i know uh, i think i might have had him in a class years ago and i'm not sure but one of my customers in tennessee and uh and after i heard all the details or at least the preliminary details of that accident in that investigation, it was like, you know, I know that I thought I knew those folks better than that. Why would anybody do what he did? But that seems to be the question every time it comes along. But in the book, in the book, I have, I started when I was uh, graduating high school and I went from there to uh, straight into Georgia Power and started working as a helper on a line crew. And that was in June of 1967. Long, long time ago. And uh, I was on top of the world. I thought it was the coolest thing that ever happened to me. I had an opportunity to do something that always had interested me. And the reason I went to Georgia Power, I had actually applied for Bell South or Southern Bell at the time. And then uh, before AT&T swallowed everybody up. And then Georgia Power. And then I got an interview with both companies. And then I chose Georgia Power because of and the incident that I had seen, I covered it in the book. And uh, I was just a kid. And, and there was a, a neighbor of my grandmother's that was in Pinville, Georgia, of all places, just north of Rome, Georgia. And they were actually installing an outside TV antenna. Well, somewhere in all of this, standing the antenna on the pole up and all that before they got it stationary and you know, strapped to the eve of the house, uh, they lost control of it and it fell over into a primary. And, uh, you know, that was, and I now know that it was 4KV at the time. Uh, and it, it was awful. It, it lit up the whole world, uh, killed one of them right there and burned the other one up. And they took him away in the ambulance. I never knew what happened to him from that point on. But I thought to myself, even as a young kid, I said, how do you control that much power and not hurt yourself? But yet every house has got lights in it in a controllable nature. That's what struck my fancy. 
And so, you know, when I was hired back in 67, I walked into the operating headquarters of what we used to call the hole on Riverside Drive in Macon, Georgia. And I walked into that storeroom and saw all the material, the squeeze ons, the wire, the transformers, the sleeves. And, and I looked at this and said, my gosh, I'll never, I'll never remember all of this stuff. <laughs> But, you know, with time, you do, and you get used to it, and you have good good, good people you're working with, like Chick Etheridge, and I'll just pick on him, and he's not here anymore, bless his heart. Um, Chick was a permanent truck driver because he never could, he never could climb. So he, they did have a position at that time called a permanent WTO, winch truck operator. And so they made that classification a desirable place to stop and plateau if you could not physically or whatever do line work. You could always operate, you know, a Dick or Derek truck or a trencher, or, and he even went on to operate a crane. And he was just one of the neatest guys I, I've ever seen. <laughs> you could tell him to go get a 301 copper squeeze on, a six to six copper squeeze on off his truck at night without a flashlight and he would go and get it and bring it straight back because he knew exactly where on that truck they were and everything was dressed right dress and everything was perfect and chick was one of those individuals that you just uh, he's amazing i know in 67 when i went to work there uh, georgia power had been in hard hats for about two or three years i think in 64 thereabouts uh the EEI, Edison Electric Institute, decided they wanted to run this test and basically said, well, hard hats was one of the things back in those days, the omission of a hard hat or not having one, you know, people were bumping their heads on things and people were dropping things on them, but they were also wearing, you know, baseball caps and fedoras to snuff out arcs on a 4KV switch when they were climbing and uh, you know, it's just one of those things to where if they, you, you don't look up when you climb, you look at your feet too much and you blow to bump your head on the primary. So we went into hard hats. And so, uh, when I got there, we had what we call the old turtle shell hard hat. It was smooth all over. Very few, you didn't have very, very many ridges in the hat itself. And, <laughs> Uh, I know I stopped. I was think I was, I think I had gotten to the point of being a, <clears throat> a truck driver and I had stopped at a grocery store on the way home. Chick lived the same direction away from the headquarters I did. And uh, I was in the gro grocery store walking down an aisle and I looked over on the aisle next to me and there goes a Georgia power hard hat walking down the aisle. And I'm going, what is that? <laughs> and Chick was so proud of his job at, at the Georgia Power Company and that hard hat, he wore that thing home. He had, he had to have it on in his truck and everything else, but he was just a neat guy. And he's some of the people like that. And I go into a lot of detail with the people I started with at Georgia Power way back in the day, if you will. And, you know, he was just one of very many that taught me a lot. And he had a, he had as much time as some of the linemen did, but you know, the linemen would come and go and make, they'd make local managers or they'd go into safety and training. They, they would pass on and move on, you know, to another job. And, and Chick was already always there. And another fellow that I, that went on later to be our, uh, he was our line supervisor. His name was Cecil Brown. And of course he's not here anymore either. And Cecil and Chick, and then later Ernie Campbell, who I went to school with, we graduated high school the same year, I think. And uh, they were they were the underground network underground department. Well, of course I was overhead distribution and underground direct buried under underground, so I didn't sweat lead too much and wrap hot tape. I mean, I did a little bit just. I was filling in sometimes just to just to see what it was like on that side of the business, but I found out that you know uh, making a transition um, <laughs> joint from crosslink polyethylene to 
to a three-phase paper insulated lead cable was not my bailiwick. I said, I'm not going to do that. But Cecil had been over there forever and ever. Amen, brother. I'm telling you, he's, uh, and then he finally went on and made line supervisor when we finally moved that operating headquarters from Riverside Drive to what is now known as Key Street operating in the old Macon district. And it was just really a neat thing. So we, all the stories or a bunch of the stories will start on Riverside Drive. And we will talk about the people that I dealt with there and managers, you know, and one of the, one of the, one of the best superintendents that I ever worked for. And he was, he was the district superintendent, the boss, so to speak. And it was uh, Doodle Grub, Ed Doodle Grub. And the only reason, his, his nickname was Doodle because he was an engineer at heart. And whenever he wasn't working in school or doing something, he was always doodling on a piece of paper. So that's how he got his name, Doodle Grub. Now, Doodle was one of those guys. I remember one night we were changing out burn-up transformers. I was a truck driver and apprentice, I think. Two linemen was with me, three-man crew. We went out, and, of course, it was one of those June, July nights in Macon, Georgia, where it was just hot as blazes. And, of course, back then, air conditioning was beginning to be a big deal. And we were burning up transformers every night when that temperature would go up. And Doodle would get – he was the kind of guy – he was the superintendent, but he was the kind of guy – he would get in with them. We had an appliance service truck that delivered refrigerators and stoves and washing machines and things. He would get in that appliance service truck, load up five or six transformers, third 25s and 37 and a halfs. And as we were taking them down, he would bring them out there to us and, you know, keep us from having to haul them out there. And, and of course, a lot of them would just have to let sit because the oil would be boiling and Inside the transformer, the oil would be gurgling and bubbling. You could t- couldn't even touch it. You, I've had to knock them out, just leave them out, let them cool off, and then go back an hour or two later, you know, to, to where you could actually change it out because it was just too hot to handle. But those are some of the people that I grew up with uh, along there. Uh, I think of another fellow named Buck White, and he was the metering supervisor, and his son, Chuck White, Basically, and I wound up in Jonesboro. I was a supervisor up there, and Chuck was in marketing sales. But you know, and but all of them were working there. And Buck was really a neat guy, really a neat guy. Uh, another guy named Harris Floyd, and I, and Harris was. <laughs> there's a story in that book about Harris Floyd that I'm not going to mention here on the podcast because I want you to read the book. But Harris was one of those very, he had a very dry sense of humor. And the first time I ever met Harris Floyd, he was, I had gone with a lineman into Vineville substation off Pineland Avenue, Roth Avenue in Macon to get a, we were going to get a breaker and put it on a a one shot. What we used to call an R switch. So we went in there and Harris was in there working. And I asked him in there, I said, golly, Harris Transformer home like that all the time. He said, all the time. And I said, what? Don't don't it ever bother you? He said, it bothered me a whole lot worse if it didn't hum. And I'll tell you how much it bothered him in the book. So I'll let you I'll let you read that story in the book because it's is very humorous to say the least. But uh I never will forget Harris told me when he walked to the gate, he knew I was a brand new helper on on a line crew. And I of course I he had more vacation days and I had company time at that time. So it wouldn't, he said, son, he said, put your hands in your pocket and you leave your hands in the pocket the whole time you're walking around in here. Don't touch nothing and don't raise your hands over your head. And that was the kind of sincere guidance that I got when I was a young helper on a truck drive, on a, on a line crew. It was, it was just, uh, I think back on all all the things, and there's a lot of things in that book that I could have talked about, you know, but I was afraid I was going to make the book too long and scare everybody off. I didn't want it to look like a Webster's Dictionary when I started. So I did not uh, cover everything that I could remember. And I know the first person that read it got an e-book. He, he ordered the... Uh, he ordered the e-book off of uh, Amazon because the published book didn't come out. I don't think... I don't think it actually 
I got a box of books that they send to the, you know, the, the writer, the, the person who the author, and I don't know, it's been a couple of weeks ago, but I think the published version of the book didn't get to Amazon until, and went on sale until like Friday a week ago, maybe. And uh, there's, there's just so much in that that I said, well, you know, I'd love to do some more and some more. And I said, nah, let me see what, let me see how this is going to go before I get too carried away. But it, it wound up being, a, it's probably, it's not that long. It's about 37, 38,000 words. So it's about 70, 60 or 70 pages, I think. I, I've got some over here and I hadn't even looked at them. I mean, I've read it online, but I have not looked at the book itself yet. So I don't really know. Uh, it has a, it has a pretty neat, you know, cover. Uh, I let the, uh, the publisher do that and they, they drew up a cover and then they get a little, they got some information on the author and the inside and all that. So, but it's a, it, it's really a good book and we cover everything as a, from an apprentice up to a journeyman to reconducting accidents that occurred. Um, as most of you know, that if you've heard me talk about art flash, I've had, I had one bad one when I was I, about a year in about, I was, I was 73. I'd been a lineman a little over a year. Cause it took almost four and a half years for me to get to uh, get to the journeyman ticket. And then, and I, about the time that I really thought I had arrived and everything was going well, I like to kill myself. You know, it's one of those things. It's like crap. Uh, now, Gene Conger, which is another one of my running mates, and he's he's still down there in Macon, retired somewhere. But Gene and I had cut in a set of 1,200-amp gang switches on some 750 uh, MCM wire, you know, triple AC. And we had cut that in, and in between 2,000 MCM riser poles, UD riser poles, and we had this customer out there that was they they wanted a they wanted a, a a dual feed on so we actually split a circuit cut a set of gang switches in ran open on the two million potheads and fed it in that way and then put a transfer switch on the underground. Well, we had just got through uh, cutting that gang switch in, and you know everything was going along really good, and we were looking. We cut the gang switch in, adjusted it, took the mechanicals off, you know, got, you know, did the switch and got it, got it a normal open point, so to speak. And so about the time we were folding the tent, getting ready to go back to the headquarters, somebody said, well, while you're out there, I want you to run by and take slack out of the slack span primary. And I said, oh, God, you know, I thought I was through for the day. (laughs) And we got over there and looked, and sure enough, it was uh, not a pretty sight. Somebody had uh, somebody prior to our being there had set a pole, and they didn't line the guys up. They had them didn't have them offset a little bit, and it was a flat to vertical uh, slack span. It was only about thirty feet long because they just couldn't couldn't put a, a guy down on the pull off pole because it was too close to the road. So they slack spanned it over about 30 feet and then they put some guys down and they'd pull the wire from there. Well, the, the problem with all that is one, if you don't put the guys down about five degrees out to the left of what the, the dead end is, the even the weight of the slack span will eventually pull that, pull that pole over a little bit. Well, when it did, it put more slack in the primaries, and every time the wind blows, the dang things that flop together. Brrr, uh, there it goes, operating the station. So we got over there, and Gene and I looked at it and said, well, here's this. Now, we talked about it, and that was a long time before job briefing was ever required. <laughs> this in the standard right now. We talked about this job, and Ed Lunsford was a blue slip foreman that day, and we looked at it and said, look, there ain't no way you can rubber this thing up. So I told Gene, I said, here, here's what we need to do. I said, let you hold. It was going to be the, the outside face on the buck arm because it was rolling vertical off the main line to flat on the dead end. I said, you hold it and let me just put, put the wrench up in there and I'll back off that three-quarter nut a little bit on that slack span clamp. And we'll just slide about three or four inches through the clamp. We might have to put no jack straps on or nothing because it's so slack that I was afraid it's going to get together. 
Well, that was a good plan. I put a split blanket around the post top insulator, the slack span insulator that was standing up vertical on the steel arm. And uh, when I did that, I had le I left the, I didn't look, you know, here we are, year lineman, more interested in distracted about the slack span than I was about my cover. Boom, there's, there's mistake number one, big mistake. And then, of course, I wrapped the split blanket around and overlapped it, but the just the bare little, just the tip of the uh, steel arm was sticking out between the the fold over on the split, and I didn't notice it. Well, uh, of course, Gene gets the face; he's holding it. I stick the wrench up in there. It was it, back then, just to be honest. I'll date myself right here. It was an air wrench. It was a Chicago pneumatic. It was before we even had hydraulic wrenches. And basically I stuck that wrench up in there to, you know, 7,200 volts with four spans from the substation, see the substation right down the street. And when I did, the wrench hit the steel arm and I had the, the socket on the, the hot phase, 7,200 volts. And of course the whole world blew up. And, you know, just as soon as it happened, we both knew what was going on. Didn't know why at that time. And then until this day, I still hadn't figured out, well, I do now, now that Hugh Hoagland helped me understand this. But I found out I should have been burned a whole lot worse than what I was burned. I mean, it was about 8,000 ounces of fault current, probably 8 cal arc. And when that happened, and it just seemed like the whole world, the guys on the ground said they couldn't even see us because we were at the booms of the two high rangers went up into the ball of fire. So they couldn't even see the buckets. We were not in good shape. Well, when it was all over with and the fire went out, the breaker locked out, it seemed like about a week, but it was really only about four to six cycles, I guess. And it locked out. And I looked around and I looked at Gene and Gene looked at me and I said, I'm sorry. I said, I know, I did it. I know, I know. Just didn't know why, but I did it. Well, as luck would have it, the... You know, we were, it was a six foot steel buck arm, the dead end was, and I was on the outside face, but the ground wire had gotten trapped up under the gain on the steel arm. So when I hit that steel arm with that wrench from that hot phase, the, the real fireball was another three and a half or four feet away from me. That's why I didn't get hurt any worse than what it was. Because, you know, now understanding that the, the incident energy of a flash is inversely proportionate to distance. You know, you figure everything on an 18-inch test right now for, say, it's 8 cal, and I was about three and a half feet away, so I doubled it. So instead of 8 cal, I had four or less, and I was standing on the outside of the arm reaching in, so it was a little, even a little bit further away. So anyway, that's uh, that's enough about this time. I guess my podcast is running a little long. I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't didn't notice what time I started, but I get to talking and uh, I just enjoy recounting everything so much and sharing what I've learned. The bottom line on that one is pay attention, cover it up, and make sure it's covered up, and then look for any of the special things around number three in a in a job briefing. How well should everyone pay special considerations? And that is, if I'd have seen that pole ground underneath that steel arm, we might have changed that while we were there, and it probably wouldn't have been as bad. It still been a flash, but it wouldn't have been as bad as it was. Well, I'm going to wrap it up here. Well, with that, I'll, I'll end by saying Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's, and God bless each of you. Please, please, please be careful. We've had way too much stuff happen this year. And gosh, it would be great if we could do next year with nothing happening. So, and we can do it if we set our mind to it, pay attention, and and don't don't make the same mistakes over and over again and expect a different outcome. Thank you again for listening. I appreciate it, and I'll see you soon. The views, information, and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of utility business media and its employees. It is strongly recommended that you discuss any actions or policy changes with your company management prior to implementation.